record. All right, so we're back in class with Carr, and I decided to go into my library. Yeah, he's I got see, a library. I love it. But, I but you got like that. Yeah, I, <laughs> I got. See that I James got, Baldwin back there. I see. Yeah, I, see, yeah. Uh, I got my lynching book, my Without Sanctuary. Oh yeah, my Patty, my Patty LaBelle cookbook. Oh, I see Patty. I published. I published Billy's that. Own. And then, and then the one I was saying about children of children keep coming. Russell Russell Goings with the original. Yes. Um, let me let me pull. Let me do what you do. Come on now. Uh, Come on let now. Me, let me say. So this is a yeah. uh, this is there children is. of children. This is Russell yes. Goings, one of the first black men uh, to have a seat on the stock exchange. My and God. this is a book about the history of black people done with the original sketches of Romare Bearden. Here's Frederick oh, Douglass. Oh, look at Fred Douglass. Yeah, you yeah. This is, this is my is book. A treasure. Look, Hunter, you see that? I published that, you right? You know what? Now, Come see, on now. I'm, I'm flexing. I'm flexing. In, in the big stacks, I got that book. When I come to New York next, I got to get you signing. Okay. All right. Right on. Sign it right under my name. How many black people can point to the spine of a book? Come on. Come on. Says, Wait, let me do this again. Let me do it again. Y'all need to understand. A hunter. A hunter right there. Yes. yes. Yeah, that's what As most deaf say, observe the excellence <laughs> of that. I love, <laughs> what you I love it. All right. Okay. Enough of this. Enough of this. Okay. We're here. And this is history right now, right? Uh, we're in class with Dr. Gray Carr, Africana Carr. Subscribe. Hit that like button. Juneteenth. All right, so y'all's president mm. announced that he was going to go to Tulsa, Oklahoma, birthplace of Black Wall Street, Greenwood, Tulsa, Oklahoma, which we talked briefly about here on, yeah. on, on this space, to have his first Klan rally, I mean his uh, presidential rally, on Juneteenth. Now, he has since said he's going to cancel, you know, he's postponing it because he didn't realize, out of respect for Juneteenth, he didn't realize it. And since, since everything, since the world has been on fire, the uh, NFL has declared Juneteenth a national holiday. Nike, Nike is, has declared it a national holiday. They're giving their workers day off. Twitter has a whole, yeah, they have a whole Juneteenth thing uh, as well. The, their black Twitter space, I actually went to their black, uh, their Juneteenth celebration last year. It was, you know, red, red soda and red velvet cake. It was a lot okay. of fun. Yeah, I actually did that at Twitter last year. So, so let me just be transparent, Dr. Carr. I did not know what Juneteenth was until I think I was in my 30s. I'm from New Jersey, as mm -hmm. everyone knows. I love being from Jersey. Nope. Uh, I didn't celebrate Juneteenth. We celebrated the 4th of July. Sure. Like most Americans, like, you know, in, I grew up in a black household, pretty woke. Yeah. But Juneteenth was not something that we understood or knew or did or talked about. Is that is that the uh, is that on purpose? It wasn't unusual. Okay. It wasn't unusual by then. If, if we think of Juneteenth in terms of when it has been celebrated and where it has been celebrated, um, it went through. It's gone through ebbs and flows. Uh, it flowed, of course, out of the uh, General Order Number Three, Gordon Granger, standing um, in the Confederate, well, the former Confederate state of Texas. Uh, on June 19th, 1865, when he read the field order uh, declaring that Africans uh, were no longer enslaved. That, of course, meant that the, uh, the end of the Civil War, which had taken place in April 1865, had, the news had finally reached Texas. Uh, okay, so let's, let's put it in um, terms of, I guess, so 1865, Yes. everyone's free. And that, so well, I imagine, so it's four million people. Yes. How did they get the message out? Well, this is this is just it. And so I mean to, to answer your question directly in terms of why you may not have celebrated it in, in Jersey was that from 1866, which was the first official Juneteenth celebration, still right there in Galveston. So the Port Arthur area, Galveston, Texas, uh, near Houston, about 40 miles outside of Houston. From 1866 up through the end of the, the 19th century, it was a Texas thing, Oklahoma, parts of Kansas, Louisiana. We'll talk about why it spread those places. And then you see, as we enter the 20th century, you begin to see a kind of diminishing in the ritual that lasts really through the 1950s or so. It picks back up with the Black Power Movement of sorts in the 1960s. By the end of the 1960s, you begin to see it flourish other places. And then it really gains momentum in the 70s. 1972, you see a kind of rebirth of sorts. By the end of the decade, a young brother uh, out of Houston uh, actually uh, uh, advocated for it as he entered the Texas State Legislator as a freshman in 1979. Uh, he pushed for it uh, to become a national uh, a state holiday. That was successfully adopted in, in 1979, 1980. It became a, a state, state holiday. State in, in Texas. 
a Texas State and, holiday. Texas State holiday. Okay. And then what you see, that was Al Edwards, Representative Al Edwards, who actually just made transition this past April. He hadn't been gone long. Okay. And then from there, through the 80s, you really see a reflourishing in Texas and the Southwest. Some places it hadn't, it never stopped. Texas, is, uh, Houston is an epicenter. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But then you begin to see it spread beyond Texas. And you really see it start taking off in the 1990s. Uh, and if you look at the states that adopted Juneteenth, uh, some of the earliest states who adopted it as a state holiday include, of all places, Minnesota, because there are Black folks who migrated to Minnesota. Are you serious? Yeah. Minnesota? Rochester, the, Minnesota. The death place of George Floyd? Well, it, well, listen, this is what, look, as, as we've been saying, the ancestors are remarkable. There are no mistakes. George Floyd was from Houston, from the Third Ward, has a direct Juneteenth link. We're going to talk about it in a second. So, okay, before, yeah, before we Minnesota, get to that. And, and uh, so, so in, in, in the 20 years from 2000 to now, that's when you see the states begin to adopt it. But it's really the Black nationalists in many ways who make it real in places like Philadelphia, Boston, where in Massachusetts, they come up with a Juneteenth flag uh, early in the early 2000s and so forth, DC, and it converges with other rituals like African Liberation Day and others. So it's not unusual that you uh, growing up in Jersey wouldn't have celebrated it, that me in Tennessee wouldn't have celebrated it. Whereas now if you go back, it's not only not that uncommon, it's on the upswing. We can go, we'll, we'll, now we can, we can walk okay. through how we got to where we are today, but it's not, it wasn't unusual. Okay, so you didn't grow up uh, as a kid knowing about Juneteenth either? No, no, I didn't, but we both grew up knowing rituals that are associated with Juneteenth, but okay. even people who celebrated them would not have called them Juneteenth rituals, and we'll get into that too. Okay, all right, I'm looking for, look at this, all right, subscribe and hit that like button. Okay, go ahead, Dr. Carr, break it down. No, no, so, so like I said, I mean, okay, so all right, well, we can start like this. Juneteenth is only one of many rituals that our people created to observe or to celebrate or to commemorate moments when they achieved through struggle, through combination of circumstance or however they, they achieved it, they achieved freedom in the Western Hemisphere. So the cousins of Juneteenth go throughout the hemisphere. Um, for example, we talk about Emancipation Day. That's usually in the Caribbean in August because that's when you see somewhere between the 1st and the 4th of August, many African, uh, well, many P Africans in the Caribbean, that's when those countries uh, won their independence in the 19th century. So, you know, Trinidad, Tobago, Jamaica, I mean, you have, in fact, there, there's an emancipation, well, what used to be called Emancipation Park in Houston, coming back to that in a second, there are only a couple of others in the country. One, uh, Booker T. Washington Park, he's called that Emancipation Park too, in nearby Comanche Crossing, Texas. Uh, but the other one I'm thinking about is in the Caribbean, in Kingston, Jamaica, Emancipation Park. So, so Juneteenth is part of emancipation celebrations, and, they, and they're known by different things. Freedom Day, Emancipation Day, Jubilee, all of them connected with when did we take our freedom, or when do we celebrate our freedom. Notice there's one glaring omission from that list, and that would be the 4th of July. And that's because Black people never looked at the 4th of July as their independence, because it wasn't. Right. In fact, if we go back to the famous 1852 speech that uh, Frederick Douglass, Douglass delivered, come on. Yes, went to the that. slave as the 4th of July, he gave that speech at Corinthian Hall in 1852, I guess it was, on the 5th of July, because people deliberately used the 5th to critique the 4th. <laughs> so when he says went to the slave as the 4th of July, he's literally saying that on the 5th to underscore the point we don't celebrate the 4th of July, we, it's because look, we're in slavery. Look at these chains. So right. there's one. Right. Um, the, and there are a number of, of, of dates. We, we'll come to Juneteenth in a, in a second. Another of the early uh, Liberation or Freedom Day, uh, Emancipation Day celebrations uh, is born during the Civil War. This one is born when Abe Lincoln signs the uh, Preliminary Emancipation Proclamation. And we all, you know, the, most post folks know, but the handful who might know, not know, Abe Lincoln was trying to get the South to rejoin the North. Abe Lincoln's strategy was not to free anyone, but to threaten to free everyone uh, who was enslaved in the South. Remember that there were several border states, Delaware being one, Kentucky being another. Um, these are Southern states uh, that didn't leave the Union. Maryland is technically a southern state. It's south of the Mason-Dixon line. 
there were enslaved people in these states. The Emancipation Proclamation did not say those people were free. So, but what it did say was, when it's released in September 1862, January 1st, any African or any African person, any enslaved person uh, in the South is hereby forever free. Well, that's cute, except that's just a piece of paper. So you, are you gonna stick that on the end of a bayonet and ram it down the throat of a Confederate soldier? That is the threat. In other words, we can't free nobody. Technically, in your mind, you're another country. <laughs> so it's like us saying, okay, Germany, you know, everybody over there now has to work a three hour work day. And they're like, oh, that's cute. I mean, how are you gonna enforce it? So when people say who freed the slaves, the answer is we freed ourselves. Because all those black people that joined the army, all those black people who were not technically military, but were absolutely engaged in military activity, like Harriet Ross Araminta Tubman, who was probably the first woman to direct troops in battle because she knew the Eastern Shore like the back of her hand and told those Union troops where to go, they're freeing themselves. Because that's just a piece of paper, bro, unless you're in charge of this territory. So there's that. And, I, and, I, and so here's the first kind of Emancipation Day to come into existence during this period. While most of our kindred are in the South of this country, enslaved, as you said, at, by 1860, about 4 million more or less. The Africans who are quote unquote free in the North, what did they do on the last day of December, 1862? They do something that you and I grew up either doing or knowing about. They went to church, they got on their knees, they prayed, they sang, and they waited until after midnight. After midnight, they celebrated the Jubilee. Why? Because it is now January 1st. 1863. And let's get off our knees, go get these guns, get off our knees, go support these people with these guns, and let's go free our families. It is the origin of Watch Night. So anybody out there who's, oh, Watch Night. Oh, yeah, no, that's massive. That, they were there as a driving thrust in Philadelphia, Boston, Newark, New York. They are in those churches in part to watch and pray and to watch and pray in the Emancipation Proclamation. It's a very powerful moment. And, uh, you know, most people in the National Park Service, those of, you know, shout out to the women and men in the National Park Service, particularly those of African descent, because when you go to these black sites in the National Park Service, they'll tell you about that. They will tell you about that at Mother Bethel AME in uh, Philadelphia. The, the, the park rangers will say, yeah, this is the, I mean, the watch night, that's one of the origins. So, so before Juneteenth, there's Emancipation Day. And they used to celebrate January 1st they celebrated January 1st for years. Mm. They would get together, they would have speeches. It would usually be around the church, they would eat, they would celebrate. I love the words of the great Silas X. Floyd, who once at an Emancipation Day celebration, this reverend got up and said, may God forget my people when we forget this day. In other words, mm. but he's talking about January 1st, he's not talking about June 19th, he's not talking about July 4th, he's talking about January 1st. So it's tied to the Emancipation Proclamation. So the question you ask is, you know, okay, so how come it took so long. Well, you're advancing news of the Emancipation Proclamation as you're winning battles and spreading throughout the South. That's why the date is going to change depending on when you heard the news. Now, you know, we think of the Civil Wars between the North and the South, and it was, but in terms of where many of the battles were fought, a great number, a plurality of those battles are in Virginia. Say right across the road from where I am right now, right across the river. I mean, the first battles of the Civil War, people brought, white people brought picnics and lunches and sat in the, on the DC side and looked at the battles. In fact, that's the, that's the origin of the Confederate battle flag. The flag that they're now throwing, trying to stop this flood of social protest, that flag began life as the battle flag of the Confederacy because the flag of the Confederate States of America, uh, of the Confederate States of America, looks so much like the flag of the United States of America. In fact, we all know that red, white, and blue combination is why the Confederacy adopted it. They thought themselves as a real American. That when they were in battle, they, the North and the South couldn't determine which flag was theirs. They were so much alike. So the Confederates switched to their battle flag, which is blood red with the stars and bars. And that's why, that's not the flag of the country they imagined. That's the flag they went to war with. But, but, but wow. the, those first battles, they were watching those battles from the DC side. So let's be clear. So by the, when you're talking about Virginia and then you're talking about North and South Carolina and you're coming out of the East Coast, that word is spreading very quickly. The word isn't that you're free. 
the first word, 1862, 1863, is that you're something called contraband. Now we know in war, contraband means that if I beat you, I'm taking, so like, yeah, stuff. Can, yeah stuff. If, if you strapped up and came down the turnpike and then came over here to DC and, you know, beat me and then took my house, then you Call get all your these, books. No, I'm just taking your books. War, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, right. And you add them to you, okay, that's it. They looked at black people and said, well, y'all not free. I mean, y'all not citizens, but you don't belong to them no more. So many black people started coming into the contraband camps that they were literally overwhelming the Union Army. So then it becomes a situation where they say, well, you know what? What, what do we do with these? What do we do with these? Yeah, you yeah. don't know what to do. Hey, guess what? They got more skills than you do. Put them to work. And that's the origin. We'll talk about that another day. That's the origin of the 40 acres and the mule promise in South Carolina. Rupert Saxon and them is like, look, hey, will y'all stay here on this plantation? Keep growing this cotton. We'll use the money to fund the war effort and it will help you ultimately. And then black people are like, yeah, you know, yesterday when y'all told us that them people had to leave, yeah, we smashed all the cotton gins, bro. We ain't picking no more cotton. So oh, 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 here's the deal. If you all will at least go do that, we'll let you keep the land. Uh, oh, okay. And that's when they start. I mean, that's, that's, that's the dream they sold them. That's why in 2020, we still talking about 40 acres in the mule because they reneged. But the word is spreading quickly on the east side. But if you in Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama, if you are west of those states, Louisiana, Arkansas, and if you're west of those states, Texas, now you got, you got a problem. Why? Because remember, the, the Civil War is really concentrated in the east. Three of the bases, the military bases that Trump talking about, he ain't changing the names because he honors these loser Confederates. Three of them in Virginia including one for Pickett. Pickett was Pickett's charge. I mean, this is where, you know, the obsession of Ken Burns and Shelby Foote and James McPherson and all these Civil War people making this into a, a, a nice battle for the soul of America with the violins playing. And they get two or three Black people, historians, to come in and weave themselves. Y'all obsessed with this mystic chords of memory and all this American myth-making. That's a Virginia story. And then, of course, in Mississippi, you see the battles, because what the North has to do is figure out how to subdue the South strategically, and the South is concentrating it for its forces. Robert E. Lee is from, you know, Virginia, Arlington. He's right there. So at any rate, Texas did not top, by most accounts, 200,000 enslaved Africans in that whole state that they wanted to be a country. Maybe So maybe 100 and 80,000, I've seen numbers as high as 250,000, but that's complete speculation because as the South was losing territory, the enslavers were beginning to come into Texas with the Africans from other places trying to hold on to them. But here's the problem. When you start coming into Texas with, former, with Africans, you trying to stay enslaved, these are human beings. So they're like, yeah, why are we leaving Mississippi? Why are we leaving Louisiana? What the hell is wrong? Oh, no, man, they're getting their ass kicked. So they talking, just like we would be talking. <laughs> so word of the Northern, wait, there's a war? Oh yeah, there's a war. Yeah, in fact, they all left here and they ain't been back. Now they telling us to pack up and come over here. Why, did, yo man, are these cats losing? Well, so you got people running away. I mean, you know, black people are not just gonna say, oh, I'm a slave, right. let me stay here. They're running away, they're going, they're moving east, they're trying to figure out, and when they move west, the word is spreading. So by the time Gordon Granger and his crew get to Galveston, Texas in 1865, the war is over. The surrender is in Virginia, Appomattox Courthouse. Sherman and them boys then going all the way to the sea, burning up everything moving. And so the word is also spreading. So Juneteenth has parallels in other places in the South, but the date isn't June. In May, in some places in Alabama and Arkansas, they say this is our Independence Day. So when you go to some of these little small towns in the South and you ask them, okay, when do y'all, oh, we don't celebrate July 4th as much as we celebrate May 4th. Why? That was the day when the old folks say the soldiers came and told us we were free. So the triggering event isn't the month and day. The triggering event is when did you find out you were right. free? Right. And, and, the, and the organization, the only organization in the, in the country that black people control where they could celebrate that was the church. So let's, so let's tie it all together. Cause all this thing, when it comes together, it's just really, it's really fascinating. Here's the thing, Gordon Granger comes in, the Confederate headquarters were at a place called Ashton Villa in Galveston. So Granger comes in June 19th, he's got 
maybe a couple thousand soldiers in the area. He goes on the balcony, the veranda, second floor of this villa, it used to be Confederate headquarters, gathers all the black people around, white people around, reads General Order 3. It's only about a paragraph, and it says, you know, y'all are free. And then, and then the last, the last couple of sentences in it say, now, y'all going home, don't leave. We, you know, go back and work for wages. Work for wages. <laughs> Negroes immediately start doing whatever the hell they, they want. Really want. Right. People walking off. <laughs> Where you going? I'm, I ain't, I'm not going to stay here. In other words, you know, this is slavery. I'm just going to walk. Wait, you coming back? I don't know. I just, you know, I like walking. I mean, so the people are moving. One thing they start doing is they start going to look for their relatives. People were sold off. People were traded. People were put out. People escaped. They start going to look to reconstruct their families. Now, let's pause here for 15 seconds and say, remember, George Floyd has a Juneteenth connection. And we will come back now to the rest of the story. So they're moving, looking for family, right? Uh, there's a lot of folklore, a lot of uh, different stories. And Juneteenth got a lot of them. You, you mentioned the fact that you had the red soda and the red cake. There's a lot of origin stories about why they why they drink that, why they eat that. Uh, one of the folklore stories that, go, in terms of looking for your relatives, ties back to the song uh, in Texas. Uh, there's a yellow rose in Texas, and he goes right. There's a line in there. You know, she's the sweetest rose of color this soldier ever knew. Rose of color. But when you listen to the song, the yellow rose of Texas, and I've seen you know, a couple of friends who've written articles about this. Uh, seen other scholars write about. The speculation from some of the people in Texas that go back to slavery time is that that was a song that was written about a black dude who's in the army, who's looking for his woman. And it says, you know, got a line there, you should play the banjo slowly. My heart is full of woe. I'm going out to Texas to find my Uncle Joe. Banjo? Oh, it's black people. That word is an African word. Uncle Joe? What are you talking about? I mean, is the Yellow Rose of Texas about a black person? <laughs> it's like, because they're looking for their family members. So that comes immediately after. In the year between 1865 and 1866, when they celebrate the first Juneteenth formally, June 19th, 1866, there's a lot of that activity. There's a lot of, I mean, and when you go to the like, um, probably the best single source for quick consult, well, the Library of Congress has the WPA so-called slave narratives online. If you go to the Library of Congress, Shout out to the great librarian of Congress, Carla Hayden, black woman, Chicago, Baltimore, sister runs the Library of Congress. So, you know, under the LOC on the website, you can look at the narratives. And if you type in Juneteenth or look around, you can get origin stories from that last generation of enslaved Africans who were interviewed in the 1930s about what they remembered. And I mean, the stories will have you cracking up, they'll break your heart you know, one of the legends and one of the things they were told, or one of the things they remember and swear by, swore by to the day they died, was that one of the reasons they didn't find out in Galveston to the 19th, and one of the reasons other places they didn't find out earlier, was that the enslavers knew and they were trying to forestall knowledge because they wanted to get in another crop. Well, we got to get this cotton crop in so we can't tell them this kind of thing. There are stories where there's one, I remember one story where the lady- Well, wow, that's logic. It's logic, right? Yeah. So, 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 so the number is arbitrary. It's kind of squishy. We know Granger was there because they stood there and saw that. But, you know, when you start getting into Apocrypha, it's just attributed to all kind of things. Like I said, the story that comes to mind as we're talking, I mean, it's thinking about a number of them, but one, I'll tell one right quick, 60 second story. The lady says she's in the kitchen with the white woman who owns them. And this sister has her baby is on the floor. And then the white woman says, you know, y'all are free. And the lady is like, what? free what you talking about she said y'all are free the lady says she picked up her baby a little baby toddler crawling around picked up the little girl looked at her and said you're free like talking to her like she could understand it. you're free and then the lady looks and, and, and says to the white one said so when the soldiers coming because remember they've been talking <laughs> when the soldiers coming the lady says oh i don't know and she said well, this ain't no way to tell nobody they free. In other words, she waiting on somebody kicking in the door, waving right. the four four. Right, like, you know, right, 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 right. I need an official. Anti, you right. know, this is very anticlimactic. And while right. I'm talking about it, you know, y'all sold my husband. Uh, what's you know what? I see you later. So people are, you know, doing it. all right. So here we go. Very shortly thereafter, within that year, 
these black people started doing for self. They start organizing. They got a June 19th committees. They start figuring out where they can celebrate. They don't have no fireworks, so they start putting gunpowder in tree stumps and blowing them up. They cooking whole cows. I mean, they doing out. <laughs> but remember, it's organized around the church. Right. So what do they do? They start going to church on the 19th. So, it, so there's no such thing as a typical Juneteenth, but part of the rituals involve usually a parade. So in the morning, they'll have a parade of some sorts. And then late morning, early afternoon, they'll have a formal ceremony, usually involves reading the Emancipation Proclamation as part of the ritual or reading Granger's Order 3. And then they have speeches. But typically, they will have at the center of that part of the ritual a sermon or somebody preach because the church is at the center of this early on, 1860s, 1870s. And then you have uh, everything, foot races, everybody playing games, fishing, doing all kind of stuff. And they, and they build up to the 19th. So usually uh, maybe a week before or even up to several weeks before, the whole month of June they're having celebrations, they're having this stuff, mm -hmm. and they build up to the day. Somewhere in between the 17th and the 18th, a lot of times, the brothers will go kill the animals, and they big these big fire pits, and they barbecue all day on the 18th, stay up all night. Then they had a parade, then they had a speeches, then they just get bent. Everybody out here, they playing baseball by the late 19th century, they running foot races, the kids eat till they sick, they can do everything they want. The sisters and cooked up everything can be cooked. The brothers and baked up everything. And they just basically having the time. And it's all around emancipation. And so it's very interesting because in the accounts that survive, you know, that there's not a lot written about Juneteenth. There, is, there are some sources. In fact, uh, a couple of them, let me see. Just Brother William Wiggins wrote his dissertation on it. It's called O Freedom, African-American Emancipation Celebrations. That's by uh, Wiggins. William Wiggins, actually, this book is only 200 pages. This is written out of his dissertation that he had written uh, before. This book was published in 1987. He had done his dissertation a little over a decade before that. The dissertation itself is 500 pages because most of it is just testimony. He's going around the South collecting all these stories in the late 60s, early 70s, because he wants to capture this generation who remembers because their parents and grandparents told them about the Freedom Day. And so this very important that this information that, so Wiggins Old Freedom is indispensable. And then there are other books, there are a lot of children's books, interestingly, more children's books than there are other books. Um, I wanted to mention one other though, because I love this book. This is, a, this is kind of a rare book. This is Doris Hollis Pemberton. This is her book, Juneteenth at Comanche Crossing. Comanche Crossing, and of course, shout out to the sister. There she is. Hey, Dorothy. Hey, Miss Dorothy. Miss Dorothy, proper. no question. You know, Ms. we Dorothy. got good home training, right? Yes. Yeah. Comanche Crossing is near Galveston. They had a Booker T. Washington Park. And so uh, when Dor Doris Pemberton comes together with this book, she was raised in that part of Texas. This is from 1983, Limestone County, uh, where Comanche Crossing is. Their Booker T. Washington Park was also known as Emancipation Park because by the 1870s and 80s, these formerly enslaved Africans had begun to put their money together. They bought property. And when they bought property, they created spaces that they owned where they could celebrate Juneteenth. And then when Jim Crow comes in hard in the 1890s, 1900, 1910, when we talked about Wilmington, right? I mean, after that, when the Jim Crow laws really hit, they became one of, if not the only places that black people owned where they could have public celebrations. So mm. Emancipation Park, also known as Booker Washington Park, and Booker Washington actually came to Comanche Crossing to do a, a Juneteenth um, celebration. That was Emancipation Park, now Booker T. Washington Park. There was an Emancipation Park in Houston. It was the, and is, the oldest public park in the city of Houston. Emancipation Park, it's in the third ward of Houston. Emancipation Park uh, in 1872 was uh, purchased uh, for around eight, around a thousand dollars. Some people say eight hundred to thousand dollars. Around a thousand dollars by three formerly enslaved Africans for the purpose of celebrating Juneteenth. They didn't have the money to keep the park open all year, so the one time of year it was open was the Juneteenth celebration. It's in the third ward. 
oldest public park in the city of Houston. And one of the three had been born in Virginia. And his uh, wife was sold to Texas. He went to Texas. <laughs> from Virginia? Oh, from it's not unusual. You see this all the time. These Negroes yeah. cross the belly of the South looking for their people. It's no question about it. In fact, uh, Heather Andrea Williams, brilliant scholar, uh, one of the former students now scholar in her own right of the great James mm -hmm. Anderson at the University of Illinois, who writes about black education in the South. Heather, Heather Andrea Williams wrote a book called Help Me to Find My People, where she chronicles these letters where after the Civil War, black people were like, help me find my people. And they crisscrossed the whole South. <laughs> they go looking, where are my people? This brother, one of the three, ends up with the sister. Finds her. Oh, yeah. They got, they got, they bought the property. He founds the oldest Baptist church in Houston. He ends up so revered by the time he dies that they name a high school for him. His name's Jack Yates. Jack Yates High School is where George Floyd went to school. So understand, George Floyd from the third ward of Houston, one of the most historic districts in the country. In fact, that park, now owned by the city of Houston, is on the UNESCO uh, special sites list. So it's United Nations. Like this is, one of, this is one of the earliest places black people declared their independence. So when we think of George Floyd, please understand a man born and raised in Houston very likely went to Juneteenth celebrations in his own, because that is one of the oldest places they celebrated Juneteenth. And when his niece got up at the funeral, and as far as I'm concerned, she gave the eulogy. All, you know, due respect to Rem Sharp and everybody else who spoke, all the politicians, important messages, all. And when she got up and said, y'all know how we do, this is the third war. She said, they talking about make America great again. When was it ever great? And everybody was like, yeah. So I said, see, that's that Juneteenth spirit right there, almost in public display. And then, of course, she was done. And it kind of went on back to the, we got to change America now. Huh. That little girl right there, that came close to the spirit of Jack Yates. Who in 1872, this formerly slave African helped buy Emancipation Park. Wow. Now, there's a lot more to the Juneteenth story. We could talk about like the migration patterns out of Texas. So you see, after Juneteenth is celebrated there, oh, I should I should probably add that, uh, you know, Houston, Galveston, Port Arthur, Jack Johnson is from down there, by the way. They say Galveston. Great boxer. Oh the, yeah, the, the boxer, yeah. no question. Who went to Mexico? You know, Gerald Horn writes about that in his book, Black and Brown. But all the Jack, John, Jack Johnson wrote about himself. He's got, he's got a couple of biographies, autobiographies. But, you know, Houston's on the Gulf. And in terms of this celebration, it has, it has relations in the Caribbean. It's only a couple hundred miles from Cuba. And let's tie another emancipation-connected ritual. The Mexicans defeat, I think it was a French uh, 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 a French, not army, not complete army, but it was a French, it was a conflict with the French. They won this battle on the 5th of May, Cinco de Mayo. They connected their 5th of May victory with the Emancipation Proclamation because Mexico had outlawed slavery. That's part of the reason why Texas wanted to get away from them. They did not look favorably on slavery. Eventually they would outlaw slavery and Cinco de Mayo has an Emancipation Day gloss in it with a gesture toward the enslaved Africans of then now the United States. So anybody getting drunk on Cinco de Mayo, understand there's an echo of Juneteenth in even that ritual. Wow. And so when you go to Oklahoma, when you go to Kansas, remember all these all black towns, Oklahoma of course includes the three dozen blocks or so that made up collected what we refer to as Black Wall Street. They would celebrate Juneteenth as well, but the date might be in July. It, it might be Juneteenth if it was based on people migrating from Texas. It might be July based on when they got the news. So it's very interesting to see how the dates change, but the rituals are the same. So, so, so we talked about watch night with Emancipation Day. Here's the thing. When they would move away from a place in Texas, Houston, San Antonio, wherever they were, early on, now I'm talking about the 1860s, 70s, 80s, uh, even going forward, there's one thing. Well, there are a number of things, but one of the things they would do on June 19th, no matter where they were in the United States, if they were in LA now or Las Vegas or Milwaukee, whatever, what do you think they would do June 19th if they were from Houston or Texas? Drink red soda? No, what? 
Yeah, they do it. They're they going to drink some red soda in Rochester, okay. Minnesota for okay. sure. But what, what are they doing? Physically. What are they doing physically? What do we do? Like, you see, your pop from North Carolina, he went to school he's, in South Carolina. He went to school in South Carolina. He's from Newark. He's from, but his, from his Newark, His family's right? from South Carolina and Florida. Did you ever go to Annie? I went... I would spend with time with my mother's uh, family in Augusta. So my grandmother, okay, so every summer I would go to Augusta and then spend time seeing my grandfather in Somerville, South Carolina. All right. So have you ever been to the summer ritual at a church called Homecoming? No, not that church, I can remember. Most churches, most black churches, and certainly in the South have something called Homecoming. That means that once a year, the people who would be yes, affiliated. of course. Okay, yes. You Go know ahead. it, right? Please. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, of Go course ahead. you know it. Yeah, yes. yeah, I was saying it wrong. Yeah. Trust me. You know what no, I'm no, talking. No, no, no. You were saying it right. I just wasn't connected. It. Go ahead. No, nah, but, but 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 no, but but you know, see, see, see that recognition. Yes. We all know homecoming. It's the or. Do you know the origin of homecoming? I do not. The rituals of return. Yes, you do. You know it now. Wherever they were, if they could do it, June nineteenth, they came back to Texas. That was the one time a year everybody come back. Yes. We do things, it's inherent. Yes. Without any connection to why. We just we do it. Know. We even even watch know. night. Like, you know, why am I going to church? Do you know, I think praying in the new year, you know, right. it feels right, but yes. there's a connection. There's a connection. So people say, I didn't celebrate Juneteenth. Yeah, you celebrated some form of emancipation, but it wasn't called that because we, like you said, we do it, but the playbook for it is somewhere in the attic. So we just gotta go back and get the playbook because we still do the stuff. So we got watch night, we got homecoming and watch this. If they're coming home, it's because they're part of the family. The family reunion is a black thing. It came out of the emancipation, out of free. Now, of course, everybody in the country does it, but its origins are Black oh. people reuniting their families once a year. Mm. And when around Juneteenth and those Emancipation Day rituals, it was concentrated around the end of the war. Where, because the whole idea was when our families were broken up during enslavement, after the Civil War, when people went out to try to find their families, whether you found them or not, and establish these institutions, once we've got something established as ours, we will never let it go. We will return to this, even if it's only once a year. And of course, all the HBCUs have homecoming and all the HWCUs do too. But the HBCU homecomings are different from the white ones in a lot of ways. But here's the main way. I didn't go to Gramlin. No, but it's Gramlin homecoming. Let's go. I didn't go to Howard. No, but it's Howard homecoming. Let's go. Why? Because if you black and there's a black school, you go to the homecoming. Yes. <laughs> Why? Because that's how we did it. That's how Juneteenth was. You ain't got to be related, man. We can already have this party. Come on. It was all celebrated around black self-determination. So it's very important, and a couple other things very quickly. Um, as I said, it, it had flows and it ebbed. It flowed through the 1860s. Then it ebbs beginning, like you say around World War I, World War II, because now you got a generation of black folks whose parents or whose grandparents were enslaved. And so they are turning toward uh, the notion of the United States of America as something where, you know, you owe us, and we're going to demonstrate our good citizenship, even if it requires blood sacrifice, which means the Black people who are in World War I. Houston is an interesting case again. Remember 1917 is where they got these brothers on this military base in Houston, and they get mistreated, so they end up shooting these white boys, and next thing you know, they court-martial them, give them the death penalty in 1917. Houston doesn't have a military base, in part because the white people in control of the city is like, yeah, we can't have no military base here because we don't want no... Black, black soldiers. Soldiers with guns. There's <laughs> no question. So you see Houston, now have one, mind you, another one of them Confederate named uh, bases, the big army base, Fort Hood, Fort Hood, Texas. Hood is a, is a Confederate general, and by all accounts, a terrible Confederate general. So, so but, but 1917, of course, you then see the, the race riots in the East St. Louis, like we were talking about with Wilmington. You see 1919, Red Summer. Red Summer, yeah. You know, 1941, you have uh, World War two breaks out. So Juneteenth has diminished in importance by then because now you're into like the third generation, fourth generation after enslavement. The memory of slavery is still there in terms of the stories, but the rituals have kind of begun to either diminish or turn toward July 4th, even as Black people are celebrating July 4th slightly differently and under Jim Crow, they ain't doing it together at all. One exception, now we let's move to Dallas for a minute. 
1932, a dude named uh, Antonio Maceo Smith, a leader, black leader in Dallas, wants to get a celebration together to kind of bring back a Juneteenth feel. Why is this man named Maceo? He's named Maceo because the name Maceo enters African US memory. I mean, you know, according to James Brown's, you know, play saxophone player, Maceo. They say a Maceo, Macheo in Spanish. Uh, Antonio Macheo, called the Bronze Titan, was one of the black Cubans who helped fight in the Cuban Spanish War that the United States jumped in and caused now the Spanish American War. It was a Cuban War for independence. And black soldiers who fought in that war had so much respect for the black Cubans who they did not know existed before then, that when they came back to the United States, they started naming their children after this wow. black Cuban who was like, that's where the name Maceo come from. But this man was named Antonio Maceo. He took the whole name. Antonio Maceo Smith says, we need to bring this thing back. We need to bring this thing back. They done forgot about this, this emancipation thing. So he goes to the people in Dallas, the leaders of Dallas, I need some money for this kind of haul because Dallas is getting, Texas is getting ready to celebrate its 100th anniversary of existence. And they tell him, no, nah, man, we ain't giving you no money. So what does he do? He goes to the federal government and gets money for a Negro building at the Texas Centennial Celebration. He got art from Aaron Douglas in there. He got all the poets. He done brought people from all over the country. It's really remarkable. And he becomes the deputy director of the Hall of Negro Life. And he says, we're not <laughs> going that. to, you know what I'm saying? We're not going to forget <laughs> this thing. And, and the other thing I mentioned about him, Smith, Antonio Maceo Smith, is the lead plaintiff in some of the most famous cases. Anybody who's watching this, we had her conversation, who was going to law school, who has studied the civil rights movement, Thurgood Marshall, Charles Hamilton Houston, his teacher, the cases they used to break the white primaries in the South. Smith versus Allwright. The cases they used to integrate the law school, uh, Sweat versus Painter. Smith is the one who's pushing for this. So the Juneteenth spirit is animating this war on all fronts. And then, finally kind of bring it all together by the end of world war ii the double victory campaign you know victory at home victory abroad we want to have we you know we're americans we want all the rights of americans so juneteenth is kind of diminishing but then the 1960s hit and in the 1960s of course civil rights movement then the black power movement you got a whole new influx of pride in history pride in culture so by the late 1960s Mm. You see Juneteenth pick up renewed interest. And by 1972, they have uh, a celebration and there's a 1972 resolution that is, a, that is brought up by two black Texas state representatives, um, Zan Holmes and Curtis Graves. Zan Holmes is from Dallas, Curtis Graves from Houston. They, they introduce this into the Texas legislature in 1972 and the legislature adopts a resolution recognizing Juneteenth, not making it a holiday, but recognizing it. And then there are a number of, they have a celebration. They put a celebration together. In fact, there was an artist named Buford Evans. Buford Evans uh, is an artist who puts together a number of paintings that they put this exhibition together in Houston. And he's got one entitled, I Remember Juneteenth. And so, and so he's saying, you know, I want to bring up the spirit of those who used to celebrate Juneteenth. And that's when you see the Juneteenth Renaissance. By the end of the 70s, as I said, Al Edwards comes out of Houston. Edwards is like, we're going to make Juneteenth a national ho a state holiday. Al Edwards used to tell a story where he said, um, he says, I was in the legislature and I wanted to get support for my bill. So it was a white dude from a rural district in Texas. And he said, Al, I ain't got no black people in my district. And Edward said, he looked at him and said, well, that's okay. I ain't got no farms in my district. So let's trade votes. <laughs> and so he, Edwards was able to literally lobby the Texas state legislature. And in 1979, they passed the bill and it went into effect January 1st, 1980, making Juneteenth a state holiday in the state of Texas. And from there, it has taken off from there. And um, I, I should mention in, in Wiggins' book and in his dissertation, really, is where he gets into it. He counts as many as 15 separate Emancipation Day holidays or Freedom Day rituals around the United States 
uh, things like February 1st, for example, 19, uh, February 1st, 1940, Richard Robert Wright. Uh, Richard Wright was born in Georgia. There's a whole, we, we could do a whole thing on Wright. I'm going to talk more about we, him. And we must. Yeah, we must. Because yes. along, along, along the lines of one of the things that you are constantly urging, requiring us to think about in terms of Black economic independence, Black financial independence. Richard Robert Wright, who came out of enslavement, ended up found, founding the Industrial Bank in Philadelphia. Mm. Um, he created something called Freedom Day, February 1st, 1940. And for years, he had a radio program. He would push it. And eventually, at one point, it was a thing up and down the East Coast. And he even had conversations with Franklin Roosevelt about that being a federal holiday. Mind you, that's 40 some years before wow. Stevie Wonder put the Martin Luther King birthday celebration right. on his back. It was Richard Wright was saying, let's go February 1st. Very important to understand. Um, connecting it back to William David Chappelle, uh, he was AME. His son, Richard Robert Wright uh, Jr., became the bishop of the AME church. Bishop Wright followed by a few uh, bishops later, Bishop Chappelle. I mean, so the AME church is, the, is, is in the middle of this conversation. Mm. And so there are a number of Emancipation Day, Freedom Day rituals, and of course, um, by the 1990s is when you see critical masses of black elected officials in places like Minnesota and other places that uh, Virginia, for example, they have their first Juneteenth in 1996. That's the same year Minnesota makes it a state holiday. That Minnesota, yeah, because the Negroes came from Texas, San Antonio, and they came from Mississippi. Now they're in St. Paul, this kind of thing. And then you see in the course of the next 25 years, so many states have made it a holiday that, and this is because black people in these states are organizing. I, mm -hmm. Most of the teams I've been to in my life have been in Philadelphia. When I lived in Philly for 17 years. Ron Brown was the head of the, the, the Juneteenth committee in Philly. Not, not the uh, guy. Not, the, know, not the commerce guy. Yeah, the, 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 another, another dude Ron named Brown. Ron Brown. Right? Right. He was in charge of Juneteenth Hilarious. in Philly. There was a brother in Massachusetts. He was head of the Massachusetts State Juneteenth committee. In 1997, they designed a Juneteenth flag. Juneteenth has the flag. It's a red and blue flag, red and blue by, co by color, with an exploding star in the center. Because they took the Texas star and exploded it. They said, this is the potential of Black people. And so wow. when people, at Howard, for example, on June 19th, we, we got coronavirus now, nobody's there, but they usually raise the Juneteenth flag on the flagpole. So, but that flag's only been around for 20, 20 and a few number of years. But now almost every state in the union, I think we're up to 47 now by the latest congressional quarter, quarterly count, has uh, recognized Juneteenth officially. And uh, word on the street is that some of the Congressional Black Caucus, last I heard, it, it, it might be Sheila Jackson Lee, of course, who represents that. that area. Um, who spoke at George Floyd's funeral. Who spoke at George Floyd's funeral, that's exactly right, with Al Green, be one of them too, uh, but it looks like maybe Sheila Jackson Lee, we'll see, might be trying to introduce a Juneteenth, make it a federal holiday uh, bill this week. I don't know that it will have traction, but in this moment, when our young people, as Dave Chappelle say, are in the streets, you know, they throw in and they, and they toss some Confederate monuments out like they could have done it all along and throwing them in the street. Who knows? Who knows? We might be looking at another federal holiday soon. So we'll see. At some point, and let me thank you for this. Um, and as you're talking, I'm thinking about the significance of flags. Did Africans fly flags thousands of years ago? What? How, yes. It, so, oh, so yeah. like, I want to, I want to have a conversation about that because it, it seems like there's, okay, it seems like there's, there's a, there's a trail there. I just saw a breadcrumb. I'm like, at some point, just put it, put that somewhere, notate it. We They're not gonna let come us back to it. What you just said. <laughs> you know what? I'm no, not gonna I, forget. I'll at give some you a, point. No, I know we won't, but I, I'll give you a 60 second answer very quickly. The earliest flags I've ever seen. Uh, and there are no material flags left, but I've seen the places where they were, the stanchions, you know, where you had a flagpole coming out. I've seen them going back to Luxor, uh, Epetisut in ancient Egypt. I've, I've stood in those temples uh, a dozen times. And you can see where the banners were. In fact, the flags that they used to fly in ancient Egypt were, each flag represented a region of the country because the Nile is long. You got thousands of miles. And when they would come together for ritual days and like Epetisut, uh, which we now, and Southern Opet, which we now know as Luxor and Karnak, those were the big temple complexes in ancient Egypt. And when they would come for the annual flooding of the Nile ceremonies, they would bring a flag representing where they were from. So the answer is yes. Coming forward, I think in West Africa, I'll give you one more African example and then a Caribbean example. 
West Africa, uh, the Asafo flags, uh, Ghanaian people, if you look among the Akan people, particularly like Ashanti, Fanti, mm -hmm. you see flags that represented different cultural groups, different families. So it wasn't as big as a nation Before state. colonialism. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, I just want to establish yes. something and I, I, have, I have a suspicion. Oh, oh, yeah. we'll... oh, oh, no question. Okay. Well, yeah, the ancient Egyptians, of course, you're talking about uh, Pettisut, you're talking about maybe 2700 BC. Okay. So yeah, they ain't no, right. they, they, Europe ain't even been thought of, <laughs> no okay. question. And then, right. and then one other comes to mind is the, uh, the Veve. Uh, mm -hmm. the flags of the Haitians, the Vodun flags, which would symbolize the Loas. You have the different spirits and they would have flags depending on, you know. But there's actually, interesting, I won't get up and go, that's in the other room of books. Um, there's a book, I think, you can look at it, it's called, a, a, I think, A Flag for Every Nation or something. It's, it's I think very, I've very, heard of that book. I've heard of yeah. that book. And it, and it told the origin of the Western flags. But, uh, but yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, all right. Oh, oh, I, should, I should mention one other thing, though. I should mention one other thing about Juneteenth rituals and how they may have spread. Of course, Dr. King, it's funny how these things connect. Of course, after King's assassination in April of 1968, um, the Poor People's Campaign continued, of course. And we know that the Poor People's Campaign this year will be the day after Juneteenth, the June 20th, Reverend Barbara, Barbara, Reverend Barbara. Uh, Theo Harris, and the Poor People Campaign people, are, it's all online this year. In the mumbo. we talked about before. Mm -hmm. um, they, in, April, in 1968, uh, in May, they started, you know, the, the, the encampment for the Poor People's Campaign and Resurrection City, as you know, we know. And it lasted for 41 days. They were about a week out from breaking camp when they pulled together one final big ritual to reinforce the fact that this was a, a struggle for jobs, for economic equality, to end war, to build a multiracial society, a pluralistic society. They had that rally on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Uh, some people say as low as 50,000, some people say as high as 150,000. Coretta Scott King spoke. It was a very powerful moment of reaffirming the vision of the Poor People's Campaign. They held that rally on June 19th. And uh, it was called Solidarity Day. And the reason they held it on June 19th was because it was Juneteenth. And some scholars argue that the, co the crowd that was there, because they had come from all over the country for the Poor People's Campaign, took that Juneteenth knowledge back into the places they were from. And that, that actually makes a lot of sense because you can certainly see Buffalo, New York, for example. I was up there one summer, huge Juneteenth. Yeah, so, I heard that. Yeah, Milwaukee, huge Juneteenth celebrate Chicago, huge Juneteenth celebrate because because that black power movement and then that struggle that came after it, they just and then and it converges with African Liberation Day, which we see in 1972 and 1973. Black people started seizing on Juneteenth, going back to the very beginning where we started, as a way of articulating black freedom dreams. It was never going to be July 4th. And Juneteenth becomes a convenient holding place for us to channel all that energy of when did we self-determination when did we get free and that's why i think now going forward even more so than going backward it's just gonna get bigger and bigger yeah i think that we're in a in a movement and i think this juneteenth 2020 is more than symbolic especially since the president tried to usurp that day to hold a clan rally it's about to go down i can't even i can't even imagine uh how powerful this juneteenth is going to be but i want to just encourage everybody to celebrate freedom, but also manifest it. Manifest, manifest it. It. It, it. They have to manifest it because that's in the spirit. Juneteenth wasn't just about celebrating 19, 1865. Juneteenth was about building like they who came out of enslavement built. That's the reason they name a Jack Yates High School. That's the reason they go, you know, people come out of Jack Yates and like, we came out to build something. I mean, Roland went to Jack Yates. He don't let nobody ever forget it. Like, <laughs> I went to Jack Roland Yates. Roland Martin. Yes. Yeah, I'm with Jay. He from Third Ward. I went to Jack Yay High School. What does that even mean? I'm gonna show you better than I can tell you, as you would say. So manifest is so important. In fact, let me ask you, uh, Karen, do you think when you were starting out in your work, if you said Black Wall Street, that there would be a lot of people who would know what you were talking about? No, because I didn't really know. No. I, I didn't me hear either. about Black Wall Street till I was a full adult. Me too. And then I couldn't stop talking about it. Because exactly. I was like, so we 
post offices, airplanes, <laughs> Air, airplanes, airplanes, Dr. Carr. That's crazy. Wait, I don't know black, I don't know anybody with an airplane today. Nope. They had nope. airplanes. We had to talk about that too. Remember yeah. that black airplane com- airport airline company? They started in Atlanta. It was a whole thing about oh, yeah. book about it. You had, had a black airline company during years of Maynard Jackson. But we didn't know that. We didn't. Yeah. We, you think that's something? Go back to the twenties, bro. Come on. So <laughs> yes. So so yeah. This is. I mean, this so, is. I'm just saying it to say that. Yeah. As we recover our history, things that even in 2020, young people will say, "What? He going to Tulsa? That was Black Wall Street." Okay. Let's stay mad. Let's keep the pressure on. Let's change the world. But also, let's pause for a minute. You should celebrate the fact that you got mad because I guarantee you, when I was your age, it wouldn't have registered. Right, right. That's the right. work we well, let's, the let's thank watch. Let's thank Watchmen oh. on HBO. Shout out. <laughs> Shout out to Damon Lindelof uh, and Regina King. Regina King yeah. destroyed that, which yes. goes to show you that these awards ain't about nothing because any award they should give, she should have them all. She should have no space, all the awards. nowhere. Yes, yes I, agree. I, agree. <laughs> I agree. I agree. I agree. Yeah, but that, but that black, oh yeah, that the the way they read that. Oh yeah, we had to talk about that too because yeah. you know about that. They should, they can't have. I'm glad they decided they didn't want to do season two because the idea the black woman is God. That's an Egyptian story. So I don't know who wrote that script. Okay. You stop it right there. So yeah, don't even don't even try to bring that back. You nah. ended perfectly. The dude, he just a means to an end. <laughs> Let's be clear. On that note, subscribe. Happy Juneteenth, Juneteenth, everybody. And Dr. Carr, I appreciate you. We'll see you next Saturday appreciate right here you. in class with Carr. Yes. Follow him at Africana Carr. C-A-R-R on the Twitters. And of course, give him a thumbs up. Let him know what you think. I appreciate you. Appreciate you. You are a national treasure. Nah, you're a national treasure. Love you, sis. Love you, too.